introduce someone who's extremely valuable to our committee, both for his friendship and for his knowledge, and that's Ron Duffield. Many of you know his many books, Return of the Latter Rain, and um, we're just really excited that Ron is still with us, putting up with us, um, and, and bringing such blessings to us. This afternoon, he's going to speak on a very interesting topic for the seminar. We only have one seminar, so we, everybody gets to be here. And I'm kind of excited about that because it's an important topic, liberty of conscience. And we can see that, you know, we never thought that we'd be where we are today in this society. And if you don't think your liberties have been limited severely as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, you must be hibernating. And so Ron is going to talk about that this afternoon, not to frighten us, but to make us aware, and not only to rejoice that the second coming is near, but to really be serious and vigilant about sharing with others and bringing them to Jesus. And so Ron, it's my privilege to have you um, speak this afternoon on liberty of conscience. The entire, the entire title is The Return of Tyranny, Liberty of Conscience in the Postmodern Era. So Ron, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. All right, I, first of all, I want to say thank you to the uh, AV guy. Uh, honestly, if it wasn't uh, for someone back there controlling all those, these things, uh, we'd all uh, miss out on a lot of things. So as I start out uh, this afternoon, I, wanna, I was gonna make a few introductory remarks and then pray, but I think I'm gonna pray first and then I'll make some introductory re remarks. So bow your heads with me. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to be here. And Lord, uh, we probably don't know the times fully that we're living in, but we know you know all things. And Lord, I just pray today that you'll give me clarity as I speak and bring the correct thoughts to my mind. Lord, to impress upon us of your soon coming. And Lord, we wanna be ready. We wanna accept the message you have for us, but we also want to be part of that loud cry, Revelation 18 movement that warns the world and lightens the earth with your glory as you shine through us. And we thank you, Lord, for answering and hearing our prayer. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, first of all, besides thanking the AV guys, I wanna say uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for all the work that's gone on to put on this conference. And I can tell that a lot of work has gone into it. And I'm glad that all of you have come to uh, be part of this uh, weekend um, of studying into our Adventist past and the message that God sent us. Now you might ask the question, what does liberty of conscience have to do with the most precious message? And especially what does the return of tyranny have to do with that most precious message? And so let me just explain a little bit why I'm presenting what I am today. Um, and kind of the train of events for the next couple days. Ricky and I uh, will be presenting on the workshop. I'll be presenting today. Ricky had to go pick his wife up, so he'll be presenting tomorrow. And then I'll have two other talks that are similar or will kind of be in the same train of events on the topic of liberty of conscience in our Adventist history. I wrote a book called The Return of the Latter Rain. And the, the summary or the basic idea of the book is that God sent a most precious message to us as a people in 1888. And that that message was, according to Ellen White, the beginning of the loud cry of Revelation 18, which can only be given with the outpouring of the latter rain. And so there's, uh, I've done several presentations on that topic where other pioneers quote her as well as saying that the latter rain began in 1888 at Minneapolis as the Holy Spirit was being poured out to enable a people to go to the world with that final call, that most precious message of lifting up that, uh, the Savior, which is the uplifted Savior, the, the uh, summary definition of this weekend seminar. But what does return of tyranny have to do? Well, that most precious message came in 1888 in the context of events that were happening in the United States and around the world 
where that final culmination of events spoken of in Revelation was actually taking place, including National Sunday Law uh, legislation before the United States Congress. But why are we still here a hundred and some years later? Well, the, in the book, The Return of the Latter Rain, I do my best to describe how there has been a delay, primarily due to resistance in believing the good news on our part. But I believe that God is merciful and that there is going to be a return of the latter rain. But that return of the latter rain is going to come again in the context of challenges to liberty of conscience. We're told that in Revelation 13. There's gonna be a final showdown and that final message and the, and the outpouring of the latter rain is to prepare us to go through those events. So that's why I'm talking about this topic of the return of tyranny. And it's in that context that we want to look at liberty of conscience. Now, part of the message that Jones and Wagner gave was on religious liberty, and they very much presented on this. Now, myself, I have always presented primarily on righteousness by faith and history of the latter rain and so forth, and I've never really touched this issue of liberty of conscience. Until a few years ago, events in the world, events in our country, events in our church, events in my workplace, that got me to thinking about this whole issue of liberty of conscience. And even though I'm a fifth generation Seventh-day Adventist and I have always, you know, believed that someday there's going to be a Sunday law and, and so forth, studied a little bit about the history on that, it was always kind of something off in the future designated only to Sunday laws and that's what r religious liberty is all about. And as I begin to study into our own Adventist history, the, the pioneers even, I realized that they had a much broader definition of liberty of conscience than I did. And that they saw liberty of conscience in really the, the broadness that this country was founded on, which is both civil and religious liberty, and it takes in much more than just Sunday legislation. Now that's the culmination of the challenge to liberty of conscience, but it, it truly, uh, it takes in much more. And so as I have studied, the more I have studied, the more I realize I don't know. And so this is a new territory for me. So if I fumble along today and tomorrow, you'll understand why. But today I want to go through some principles on liberty of conscience. Just seven principles, if we have time to go through them. Principles, just broad principles, and then kind of bring into some of the events in uh, our early Advent history, things that were going on in this country with the idea that it's not just, you know, telling what happened in the past as a you know, boring history lesson, but to think about are there parallels to what's going on today? Are there parallels? Are there things we can learn, not only in our Adventist history about the most precious message, but are there parallels involving the tyranny that was going on that if, if we understand what happened in the past, we'll be better able to see what's happening today in this country? And my concern with myself was is that I, I've kind of looked at things through just one eye instead of, you know, left or right rather than broad looking at all the events and saying this takes in much more. Now, as you well know, there's a wide spectrum, pun intended, of views within our church. Some are completely throwing out the whole idea of the great controversy and end time events and so forth. Others, you know, are going to the extreme in the other direction, and we want to avoid all of these. So today I'm going to talk about principles. Tomorrow, Ricky is going to talk about the founding of the United States. That's why I actually put workshop part two. This was meant to be part two, but he had to go pick up his wife, so he'll present part one tomorrow, the founding of the United States and some of the principles there. So today I'll talk about kind of some broad principles, some issues in early Advent history. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about more what led up to 1888, events in our own church and in the country that led right up to 1888 that made Minneapolis so important. And then on Sabbath afternoon I'm going to talk about how liberty of conscience was actually part of that 1888 message brought 
to Minneapolis. And the response following that, which included, just like the most precious message, rejoicing and opposition at the same time. So that's where we're kind of going uh, over the next couple days. So uh, And I guess I'll have to go manually here. Okay, there we go. So liberty of conscience is a study that takes in so much more. Principle number one, I want to start out today. This is just a broad principle. And I know I'm preaching to the choir. Liberty of conscience is the foundation of the great controversy. It really is. Satan's attack on God really, if you boil it down, is his seeking to force conscience, compel, and persecution. Whereas God's kingdom is based on liberty, freedom of choice, and agape love. Here's a quote from Great Controversy. God never forces the will or the conscience, but Satan's constant resort to gain control of those whom he cannot otherwise seduce is compulsion by cruelty through fear or force. Do you see that happening ever in your life or in the world? He endeavors to rule the conscience and to secure homage to himself to accomplish this, he works through both, notice this, religious and secular authorities, moving them to enforcement of human laws in defiance of the law of God. So Satan works through both civil and religious authorities. And we're gonna see this in one of the following principles. So again, if you're looking for statements on, um, in the Bible that talk about liberty of conscience or religious liberty, you won't find that statement in the Bible, but the Bible is full of those principles that you can pull out from more stories. And in fact, as I have been studying on religious liberty, I find it popping up in places I never dreamt of in the Bible and in the writings of Ellen White. And I, 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 we don't have time to go in that right now. Now there's another aspect of liberty of conscience that's tied into this. In the book of Deuteronomy, that's a good book to look at when it comes to God giving people a choice. He gives a choice, but those choices aren't free from results. In other words, God said, choose today, choose me and you'll have life, choose Satan, and there's results that come with that. So there's liberty to choose, but there, that doesn't free us from the results that are tied in to those choices. So Satan seeks to trample the law of God. He seeks to lead us into sin so that he can gain, uh, control us with bondage. God, on the other hand, seeks to write his law upon our hearts so that he can free us from sin. And this is how somebody kind of summarized this idea of liberty of conscience by saying liberty is the right to choose, freedom is the result of the right choice. And that's what God is giving us, a, a choice in, in all of the scripture he's saying to us, choose today. Satan, on the other hand, this is his modus operandi. Censorship is the tool used when the lie loses its power. He seeks to lead us into sin. If we don't buy that, then he censures us. He, he uh, seeks uh, to control us, to force us, to manipulate us through fear or force into following his way. Well, principle number two as we look at this subject of liberty of conscience, is that Satan has always used a multifocal attack. And what I mean by that, and we're gonna follow this kind of train of thought throughout the presentation today, is that Satan does not just come through one form of attack. He doesn't just come, and I'll bring it down to, to current times, through the religious right, say, per se. He seeks to undermine liberty of conscience through many different angles, secular, religious, conservative, liberal, left, right, however you want to apply it. And the way I have begun to look at this is even going back to the story of Jesus. Here's a picture of Jesus standing in Pilate's court 
There's Sadducees and Pharisees there, and they're joining hands with the government. Now what's interesting, Matthew 16, Jesus warns the, the, uh, his disciples against the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now I find it interesting that when Jesus, Jesus was talking with the Sadducees, he would address the particular issues that involved their ideology. When he was talking with the Pharisees, he would sometimes address specifically, you know, where they were going wrong in their philosophy and ideas. But when he warned the disciples about the leaven, he didn't differentiate between Sadducee or Pharisee. He just threw it all into the same lump and said, avoid the leaven of the Pharisee and the Sadducees. Of course, the disciples thought he was talking about bread. And then when Jesus finally explained a little more, it finally hit them. And they said, Jesus was rather talking about the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's Matthew 16, 12. So how is it that if you boil down the Sadducees and the Pharisees' doctrine, even though they were so diametrically opposed, somewhere at the foundation of their belief, they were very much the same. And it led them, even though they, f they stopped fighting for long enough to come together in unity to crucify the Son of God. And they were willing to join in with the Roman government. And what's, what's interesting is that um, Mark chapter 8, verse 15, uh, Mark records this as, avoid the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So there's something in all three of those groups, government at that time, Sadducee and Pharisee, that included that same problem of leaven that Jesus was talking about. Pharisees were generally haters of government. Small government, conservative, legalistic. Sadducees were generally in favor of big government. They were actually, would work with them at, at, at all the time. And that, of course, brought hatred between the two groups as well. But interesting enough, in Mark chapter 3.18, when Jesus healed uh, someone on the Sabbath day, the Pharisees, the haters of government, actually went to the Herodians to seek how together they could destroy Jesus. So this is how Satan works. As I am looking at these topics more and more, and I see that this same train of, of working, Satan has used throughout history, and he uses it in modern times as well. There's so many statements you can do a search, you know, through Desire of Ages, and here's just one that kind of summarizes this. The two sects, Pharisees and Sadducees, had been at bitter enmity. The Sadducees courted the favor of the ruling power in order to maintain their own position and authority. The Pharisees, on the other hand, fostered a popular hatred against the Romans, longing for the time when they could throw off the yoke of conqueror. But Pharisees and Sadducees now united against Christ. And again, the reason I'm telling, talking about this is I believe that as we look at Adventist history, we're going to see, see the same principles. Groups that you would never think could ever come together will come together to in agreement at a final point. Well, what happened? The Jews, you know, after the crucifixion, Sadducees and Pharisees continued to persecute Christians. And then Rome destroyed Jerusalem. And that didn't stop the persecution, it only continued. Notice what Great Controversy says, the chief agent of Satan in making war upon Christ and his people during the first centuries of the Christian era was the Roman Empire, in which paganism was the prevailing religion. Have you ever thought about that? That paganism or atheism is, it's a religion. It truly is. And it can persecute. And it can um, restrict liberty of conscience. And w of course, you can see that in the history of the last hundred years all over the world. Even today in certain countries under certain religions. Well, papal Rome took over from pagan Rome and did the persecution stop? 
It only continued. In fact, it got worse. Notice this statement from Science of the Times, November 1, Ellen White says, through paganism and then through the papacy, Satan exerted his power for many centuries in an effort to blot from the earth God's faithful witnesses. Pagans and papists were actuated by, notice, the same dragon spirit. They differed only in that the papacy making a pretense of serving God was the more dangerous and cruel foe. So again, Satan will use whatever power, whether it's secular, governments, or religious. And by the way, I need to mention, when we talk about the papacy, we're not talking about individuals. We're talking about a system and its belief system that has you know, been a part of history for over 1,400, 1,500 years. Then notice, great controversy, another place, 568, Ellen White says, there's a striking similarity between the Church of Rome and the Jewish Church at the time of Christ's first advent. Now, I don't want to read too much into this, but think about what the Jewish Church was like in the time of Christ. It wasn't a unified body of believers. There was factions, diametrically opposed, and yet they came together in the time of Christ. How, is that one of the similarities to Rome? Well, notice, same book, a few pages later, Ellen White, speaking to Protestants, she says, a prayerful study of the Bible would show Protestants the real character of the papacy and would cause them to abhor and shun it. And then she talks about the, the concept of um, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And then she says these words, the papacy is well adapted to meet the wants of all these. It's prepared for, notice, two classes of mankind embracing nearly the whole world, those who would be saved by their merits, that's one extreme, and those who would be saved in their sins, here is the secret of its power. Now, remember that phrase, because we're going to come across it again. So again, I'm not, I don't want to extrapolate something that's not there, but if there's a similarity between the Jewish nation and the way that Satan used factions or groups to lead the people in general along a certain path, is it possible for him to do the same thing in a papal structure? That two groups that you would think are opposed, and by the way, we could talk about this. I mean, there are truly different views in that uh, massive church that take in these two concepts, two classes of people. And by the way, that world needs to be lightened with the glory of God, the truth that answers to both those uh, errors. Well, we'll come back to this idea of the multifocal attack of Satan, but I want to go to principle number three, and I've already kind of mentioned this. Civil and religious liberty falls under the, the, the heading of liberty of conscience. Liberty of conscience, kind of my idea before, was liberty of conscience, that's the Sunday laws, and that's somewhere off in the future. But liberty of conscience takes in both civil and religious liberty, and even under religious liberty, it's much broader than just Sunday law issues. And, and here's why I mention that is I've, I have a concern, not only for myself, but as I, you know, begin to read, read widely, that there is this concept kind of in our church or come into our church that's kind of that very thing. That religious liberty is nothing we need to get excited about now. Let's wait until the future when the Sunday laws come and then it's time, then we'll, we'll speak up about it. And I'm saying maybe today, well, just like the pioneers, we need to recognize where liberty of conscience is being challenged and be willing to stand up and address that. Now, I'm not talking about getting politically motivated and joining political groups, which we'll touch on a little bit later, but I'm talking about actually being willing to stand up and say, this isn't right. Uh, this is happening, and this is, this is taking away our liberty, uh, liberties under the Constitution that this country, that we live in in this country. Well, n notice this Ellen White, she very much expresses this. 
idea, the broadness of liberty of conscience, talking about America, which Rick, Ricky will uh, talk about more, those who first found an asylum on the shores of America rejoiced that they had reached a country free from the arrogant claims of popery and the ty tyranny of kingly rule. Both aspects, religious and civil. They determined to establish a new government upon the broad foundation of both civil and religious liberty. And I'll tell you, the more I read on the Constitution and its broadness, I can only say that only God could have orchestrated that kind of thing in a sinful world. And I believe he did it because he knew he had a message that needed to go in the context of freedom to the entire world. So United States is really formed just before that, that uh, great Advent movement in the 1830s and 40s. Again, in great controversy, republicanism and Protestantism became the foundational, fundamental principles of the nation. And I need to make it clear that when she says republicanism, she's not talking about the, the, the uh, political party of, of Republicans, that Republicans didn't even become a party until the 1850s. She's talking about the concept of a republic, the type of, the principle of the nation. Same with Protestantism. She's not speaking specifically to the religion, but to the principles that Protestantism was based on, which part of that was liberty of conscience. Part of the protest was away from the control of the church in every area of life to the freedom of conscience. And that took place in this country then. These principles, notice, are the secret of its power and prosperity. So you remember what the secret of the power of the papacy was? Two extremes, you can be saved in your sins or you can be saved by your own merits. That's the secret of its power. Whereas America was founded on another principle of liberty of conscience, which is the secret of the power of this, of this country. The, uh, the oppressed and downtrodden throughout Christendom have turned to this land with interest, hope, and hope. Millions have sought its shores, and the United States has risen to a place among the most powerful nations in the earth. Well, other um, pioneers, as we'll look at now, had the same concept. And uh, I must say, as I've read quite a bit more of Uriah Smith's work in the early articles and some of the books he wrote, I have a new appreciation for his part, the part he played in Adventism. But I also have a new sadness at the same time when I realized that during the 1888 era, you know, he rose up against some of the very principles he'd written on. And, you know, it's a warning to us today, is really. But anyways, one of the statements that he made in his book, Marvel of Nations, he says, one of these two lamb-like horns may therefore represent the great principle of civil liberty in this government. He's talking about that, that beast that has uh, lamb-like horns but speaks like a dragon. And the other, the equally great principle of religious liberty, which men so highly prize and have so earnestly sought. Loughborough, 1854, I see this in early, early Advent pioneer writings, says, where, where is a government to be found more lamb-like in its appearance than this our own nation, nation with its Republican and Protestant rulers? And again, those terms are not used in the political or religious denomination sense. They're used in the sense of the principles that are represented there. We shall then call the two horns Protestant or ecclesiastical power and Republican civil power. And so that's why this nation was founded on both civil and religious liberty to allow an environment where a message of the three angels could go to the world. Now, in the line of, to show the broadness of, of uh, liberty, that it's not just about Sunday, I wanted to show just a few statements here, uh, not uh, George Washington, but a few statements from the pioneers in regard to freedom of speech. They even either spoke out or uh, copied articles from others talking about the idea of freedom of speech. So again, they didn't just address the Sunday laws somewhere off in the future. They addressed issues in their day where they saw this great constitutional principle being undermined. 
George Washington said, if freedom of speech is taken away, then dumb and silent we may be led like sheep to the slaughter. And that's why it was built in to the Constitution. Here in an article in 18, um, I believe it was 54, they reprinted a, just a little editorial note from a, a paper, the Buffalo a newspaper, about an incident where freedom of speech was being undermined in the United States. Notice this, freedom of speech. On Thursday last, in Prince William County, Virginia, not terribly far from here, John Underwood was found guilty, notice, of uttering and maintaining that owners have no right of property in their slaves. And because he said that, he was fined $312.50 in 1857 dollars. In 1857, you know, that's a lot of money in 1857. Just for uttering the concept that you didn't, that was not your property. Here's uh, John Loughborough, 1857 as well. We see all other nations have abolished slavery or declared it to be piracy and the traffic is dying away. Other countries were actually doing away with slavery. While in this nation, United States, we see it steadily increasing. There has been a mad rushing forward of friends of slavery holding spurious elections, choosing a bogus legislature who form themselves a constitution and declare, and notice what they declared. This was uh, in Kansas. Death to the man who takes a slave out of this territory. Five years imprisonment to the man who gives a slave information that causes him to leave Kansas. And notice, in regard to freedom of speech, two years imprisonment to the man who expresses his opinion in Kansas that it is wrong to hold slaves. So you see, here's examples. By the way, I'm just, this is just the surface. And it's really struck me. Pioneers were standing up for liberty in much broader ways than just over the Sunday issue. Uh, here's another article. This was 1867 in the review. And it's actually a reprint from The Independent, another magazine. So the review is, is just reprinting at this article. Speaking of, and I hope I get this uh, Italian's name correctly, correct. Uh, general Garibaldi. He was an Italian general who was trying to bring uh, unity into Italy and, and form a government more like the United States than it had been, obviously, uh, during papal years. And this is what the Independent wrote and was reprinted in the review. Whether Garibaldi succeeds or suffers defeat, his attempt to free Rome and add to the kingdom of Italy can hardly fail to attract the attention of Christendom to the present condition of the papal states. Both the form and spirit of government are despotic there, at the time. It has no liberal feature. Freedom of speech, freedom of press, free schools, free pulpits, liberty of worship, liberty of action, liberty of trade are utterly unknown in the territorial do domains of the Pope. I think we forget how far reaching control was during those 1260 years. It's much bigger than just Sunday. And again, when I keep repeating the issue about Sunday, I'm not denying that Sunday's an issue, but it's the tip or the culmination or the tipping point, the final showdown between God and Satan. But there's so much more that leads up to this and falls under the issue of liberty of conscience. Uh, this article continues. The power of the priesthood is unlimited. The people have no rights with the, which the church is bound to respect. Popular elections have not been introduced, nor any of the safeguards of personal freedom. Laws are made and taxes imposed without the consent or advice of the people. Now that does sound somewhat familiar. I don't know. 
I wonder how much has changed in the United States and we don't even hardly take note. Well, principle number four, moral conditions in America. Now this is another interesting aspect that I'm, I'm studying under some of these broad principles of issues going on regarding liberty of conscience. And that's this idea that, that Satan uses a multifocal attack. It's not just pushing religious conservatives to a certain point. He uses other means in which to come about the same end. As you look at what happened in the United States after the Great Disappointment in 1844, there was a moral decline. And I've seen this it, I, more than I ever realized just doing a search. In fact, I'll come, there's one uh, thesis somebody wrote in a, in a journal in California about the conditions in California. And it specifically is the, the moral conditions, 1840s, 1860s, the decline. Adventism started giving the second angel's message that Babylon had fallen in 1844. And I believe there was that this, the moral decline was a result of rejecting the Millerite movement's call to a soon coming savior. And so I see that Satan used, he uses, uh, there's a, a moral decline which brings about a reciprocal response. And that reciprocal response brings about a counter response and back and forth. And, and we'll see this in uh, some of the statements here. Here's Uriah Smith again in his book, Marvel of Nations. And he kind of summarized the, the moral condition in the United States prior to the, uh, he first wrote this in 1876. He said, the people of the United States are not all saints. The masses, notwithstanding our gospel, all gospel, all our gospel light and gospel privileges, are still in a position for Satan to suddenly fire their hearts with the basest of impulses. And he's not just talking, you know, Christian and, and non-Christian, he's just talking in general. This nation, as we have seen, is to exist to the coming of Christ, and the Bible very fully sets forth the moral condition of the people in the days that immediately precede that event. And, and then he lists all these Bible texts, and I don't know, I mean, I've read all these Bible texts before, but somehow when I read them all, as he lists them out, it suddenly struck me that maybe I've always just considered that Satan's going to only move through this very, you know, uh, conservative-only religious movement. And that it's actually in the midst of moral decline that Satan will work through parties and groups. And so Uriah Smith continues here. He says, um, the iniquity is to abound and love, uh, let's see, uh, this nation as we have seen it is to exist till the coming of Christ and the people in the days immediately preceding you. Iniquity is to abound and love of many is to grow wax cold, Matthew 24. Evil men and seducers are to wax worse and worse, 2 Timothy 3. Scoffers are to arise saying, where's the promise of his coming, 2 Peter 3. The whole land is to be full of violence as it was in the days of Noah, full of lice as Sodom in the days of Lot, Luke 17. And when the Lord appears, faith will scarcely be found. There's a lot of religion though, right? But faith will scarcely be found, Luke 18. And those who are ready for his coming will be but a little flock, Luke 12. Can the people of God think to go through this period and not suffer persecution? No, he says, this would be contrary to the lessons taught by all past experience and just the reverse of what we are warranted by the word of God to expect. So again, uh, he's describing the moral situation when Jesus comes. And then he continues, and notice what he, what he describes. Let then such a general spirit of persecution rise as the foregoing scriptures declare will in the last days exist. And what is more probable than that it should assume an organized form? So, in other words, if you have even various, various groups and all the, more, the decline morally, there's a much greater chance that there's going to be this united, organized persecution. 
In this country, the will of the people is law, and let there be a general desire on the part of the people for certain oppressive enactments against believers and unpopular doctrines, and what would be more easy and natural than that such desire should immediately crystallize into systematic action and oppressive measures take the form of law. Really, just like what happened with Jesus. Liberal, conservative, come together in this synthesis and crucify Christ. He continues, in addition to this, we have spiritualism. He was talking more of religious groups there, but we have spiritualism, infidelity, socialism, free love, the trade unions, or labor against capital, communism, all assiduously spreading their principles among the masses. These are the very principles that worked among the people as the exciting cause just prior to the terrible French Revolution of 18, 1789. Human nature is the same in all ages and like causes will surely produce like effect. These causes are now, 1876, when he first wrote this, all in active operation and how soon they will culminate in the state of anarchy in a reign of terror as much more frightful than the French Revolution as they are now more widely extended, no man can say. So I hope this comes, becomes clear in, in your mind what I'm trying to say here. But this is not 2023, this is 1876. I had no idea there was socialism, free loveism, communism being taught and expressed in the United States in that era. But it's what led up to the conditions which brought National Sunday Laws in 1888. Here's uh, James White in an article, 1870, a pamphlet, says infidelity in various forms, especially in the name of spiritualism, has spread over the Christian world with fearful rapidity, while the dark record of crime has been blackening He's addressing the issue of a peaceful millennium in this uh, article. And he says, if this be the commencement of the temporal millennium, may the Lord save us from the balance. In other words, moral decline is happening all around in this era in the United States. Now here's this paper I referred to. This is actually written, uh, this was actually published in the Journal of History. Uh, and the title of it is Wicked California, 1848 to 1860s. And it describes the moral decline in the state of California. I, wow, I had no idea how bad it really was. And in there, he actually describes this situation. He, uh, the person writing this article quotes from someone else from that era who was describing the moral decline. A man wanted to go to a certain entertainment that night on a Sunday where there was going to be a bear battling a, a, a bull. There would be, you know, gambling and so forth, drinking and carousing and all the prostitution that was going on, but he kind of felt bad about that, so he decided to go to church first that day. And then he goes to this entertainment that night, and this is what he says, retrospectively, he says, it was a strange metamorphosis he had undergone, speaking of clergy, since the morning. Only four hours had elapsed since I saw him officiating at the altar and feasting upon a substance which he believed to be the actual flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ. And then that night, he sees the same person attending the same entertainment that he felt uncomfortable for earlier in the day. So this is the moral condition. And of course, I'm just, you know, this is a broad paintbrush, but there was a moral decline. And the next principle, I think, goes hand in hand. I don't know which comes first, moral decline of the nation, which leads to moral decline in politics, or moral de decline in politics, which leads to moral decline in the nation. Either way, it may be both. But here's principle number five. There's corruption in both parties. And as I read the pioneers, I, I see that very clearly they were much less political than I think we have become as Seventh-day Adventists today. 
They stood for principle, but they recognized they were careful not to get politically involved. Notice this, Uriah Smith again, political corruption is preparing the way for a deeper sin. It pervades all parties. Look at the dishonest means resorted to obtain office, bribery, deception, ballot stuffing. R.F. Cottrell, he wrote a, an article on should I vote or how shall I vote? And he, he's not, I think he's talking more of just to join a party, not, he's not discouraging voting on principle on certain issues, temperance and so forth, like Ellen White endorsed. But again, I cannot vote for a bad man for that is against my principle. And under the present corrupt and corrupting state of politics, I could not wish to elevate a good man to office for it would only ruin him. Anyways, this is, again, just a few quotes. There's so many quotes, you know, I, I find them and I put them on a slide and then I get ready to present and I have to take out, you know, half of them. Here's what Ellen White said. There is danger, in fact, there's decided danger for all who shall link themselves up with political parties of the world. There is fraud on both sides. God has not laid upon any of our people the burden of linking up with either party. We are under Christ's banner, and everyone who names the name of Christ is to depart from all iniquity. Now again, Ellen White encouraged voting on principles. I'm not, but she, she was very clear on the dangers we are in when we begin to get pulled in politically. And I'm afraid that this reason there's disunity in our church in some regards is because we have joined various parties that are in disunion with one another. And we can begin to look more like Sadducees and Pharisees instead of looking for a message that unifies all on a, a much higher level. Ellen White continues, but what kind of spirit takes hold of our people when those who believe we are under the third angel's message, the last message of mercy to the world, brothers of the same faith appear wearing their badges of opposing political parties, proclaiming opposite sentiments and declaring their divided opinions. I heard a friend of mine say, I won't say his name, I'll let him say it if he wants to, but <clears throat> he actually, I guess, preached a sermon in his uh, church where he lives in an area where it's democratic, more democratic. He preached a sermon, and if I remember the title, it was, Why You Shouldn't Have a Democratic or a Joe Biden Sign in Your Front Yard. And the whole, if I understood right, the whole purpose, the reasoning being, you just cut yourself off from being an influence on the other half of the people you're trying to witness to. I say amen to that. Amen. And this is what Ellen White is saying. Uriah Smith again, he says, politics is not our message. When we declare our neutrality in politics and refuse to take part in a contest so exciting as the one which we are now agitate, which is now agitating this nation, it is right that we give an exposition of the principles on which we stand and the reasons for our course. And he's writing this in 1856. So not only is saying we, we're, not, we're neutral in politics, but we should explain why. And when he's talking about the great agitation, he's talking about the issue of slavery, which was yet to break into the Civil War. He's not suggesting neutrality on slavery, he's suggesting neutrality on politics. Then he says, the unrighteous course of the border ruffians and the pro-slavery demagogues, sustained as they are by modern Democrats in general, he's speaking political party there, must create some feelings in the breast of those who have formally engaged actively in these contests. Though they now feel compelled to confine themselves to a question of paramount importance to this age of the world. In other words, there's something even more important than the abolition movement. He didn't, he didn't say, let's be pro-slavery. Yes, they would still vote and work against slavery. In fact, who is it? Uh, John Harvey Kellogg's father and John Byington, the first general conference president, participated 
and the Underground Railroad in the state of Michigan. They did what they could to relieve the oppression of slavery. But politically, they moved away from joining a group, even if it stood for anti-slavery because of many of the things that it attached itself to. And we could apply that to things today. There are some groups that are standing on the one hand for something good, but they also attach their, that to an ideology that is foreign, that we should have nothing to do with. Ellen White said something similar. I keep going off on rabbit trails here, but she said something too, similar about the, the women, women suffrage movement. She said, if you join that, you might as well sever yourself from the three angels' messages. Why? Because she's in favor of women suffering? No. But there's a different means to come to that end than joining a political movement that's attached to many other things. Uriah Smith continues, and we feel it our duty to confine our efforts to preparing ourselves and others as far as in us lies for the great final issue already pressing upon us, the revelation of the Son of Man from heaven, the destruction of earthly governments, the establishment of glorious, universal, and eternal kingdom. Desire of Ages talks about Jesus, why Jesus didn't get politically involved in his days and address, you know, all the time, you know, the political issues of his day. It's because he knew the way to, ch to ch make change was through individual heart changes, through the message that he brought from heaven. And it's the same for us today. Well, I'll end this section with a, with a uh, article here by <clears throat> James White. He wrote an article called Pope or President, and it's a, in quotes there because he's quoting from a book written by a Protestant in 1859 called Pope or President. I, I actually bought the book on Amazon. I'm in the process of reading it. And this, this I forget the, the author, but he's warning America, 1859, be careful, there are movements in this country that are moving us back toward a government under, you know, the forms of earlier years of the papacy where liberty of conscience is being squashed. And so he was issuing a warning, 1859. So James White is writing an article expounding on some of the themes that this book represent. And I want to bring out just one, there's many aspects of the article, but I want to point out just one of them here. So James White says, Pope or President, a book with this title was published some years since, this is 1863 when he's writing this, designed to correct the extreme incredulity of the American people in refusing to believe that Republican institutions are imperiled by the existence of the Roman hierarchy among us. Other works by learned and judicious ministers of various denominations have warned us of our dangers. Their works have failed to rouse the, rouse the Christian community. So he's saying, here's this issue, this concern on the one side that there are these powers coming in to our country. Then he quotes from this uh, person called, and I don't even know how to pronounce his first name, Orestes Brown, Brownson. He was a convert to Catholicism and he wrote quite a bit during the 1850s, as best I can tell, with a concern that the, the Catholicism change because of what he saw as issues going on. And so James White quotes from this person describing conditions in the country to support the, 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 uh, the concerns of a Pope or President book. And so he says, this is what Brownson says, it is undeniable that no religious body in the country stands so generally committed to slavery and the rebellion, or as a body have shown so little sympathy with the effort of the government to save the life and unity of the nation as the Catholic. So this is a Catholic expressing these concerns. Not a single Catholic journal except one, except one ventures to assert openly and decidedly the true Catholic doctrine in regard to slavery. And the Catholic who does not throw all his influence on the side of the pro-slavery party is read out of the pale of Catholic society. In other words, cancel culture in the 1850s 
in this community if you didn't join the pro-Catholic movement. We can scarcely find a Catholic, Brownson says, descent from an old American family or even American birth that is not practically a pro-slavery man in his talk and in his influence. And then James White kind of summarizes what he just quoted and from this uh, Catholic writer. Go where you will in the loyal states and we find nearly every Catholic we meet a southern sympathizer, an intense hater of the ab abolitionists, and more ready to see the union divided or reconstructed on slavery as its cornerstone than to see it restored by the, extin the extinction of slavery. So he goes to, you know, fairly good lengths of describing the concern on the one side. But what I find fascinating is that in this very article, here's a picture of it, he also expresses concern for the reaction to it on the other. He says a political party styled the American or Know Nothing Party, which was only around for a short time in the 1850s, attempted to grapple with the impending evil, but ignominiously failed, chiefly on the count of its under, un democratic attitude, which placed it in hostility not simply to the hierarchical rule of popery, but to all foreigners undiscriminately. The false positions of this party has done a great disservice to the cause of Protestantism by the reaction it has naturally caused. Okay, so let's pull this together. James White describes the concern of a challenge to liberty coming from one direction. But then there's a reaction from this party, which by the way, their platform was anti, they were concerned with Catholic immigration. But their re, the way they dealt with it was so extreme that it pushed both parties, both, both issues even farther. Which takes us to principle number six. And I need to, Todd, I don't, <clears throat> sorry to point you out, but I don't know, are you sitting there because you're wanting to tell me I'm, it's almost over or? No, I'm just here to listen. Oh, you're just here to listen. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> I don't have a clock up here. I, I don't, uh, any, what time is it, by the way? Oh, I got a little time then. Okay. Sorry, I just started getting a little nervous there that I uh, needed to stop. Okay. That was just a little break. Principle number six, what James White was just saying, you have one issue which brings about a response, but that response is so far this direction that it pushes the other, the other issue even farther. And this is really what number six is, left versus right. Now this can apply to church issues, this can apply to personal issues, this can apply to government issues, politics. In uh, Uriah Smith's book, Marvel of Nature, Nations, I would encourage you, it's actually reprinted, um, and I believe APL has either reprinted it or is going to reprint it. And I would encourage you to read it. It's fascinating. He's, Uriah Smith spends almost 20 pages describing this phenomena of, even though he doesn't use the terms, left versus right, and how they push each other farther and farther to an extreme. And it's in that context that changes were coming into the United States, which led right up to the Minneapolis situation of National Sunday Laws before Congress. And again, the reason I'm sharing all of this isn't just to go over dusty history, it's that if we understand this, will we be more ready to recognize these very things when they're going on in our country or around the world today? And instead of getting sidetracked politically, we can recognize the full picture and be willing to come in unity as a people and address the real underlying issues. So this is what Uriah Smith says. I'm just gonna go through several slides here to describe this 20 page uh, section that he has in his book. Now, the religious amendment that he's talking about, I need to at least add this information. In the 1860s, and we'll talk more about this tomorrow, the National <clears throat> Reform Association formed. 
These were evangelicals in the United States that said, the moral decline in our country has gotten so bad, we need to fix it. And I think they had some legitimate concern. The problem is, their way of fixing it was to join government in trying to enforce mora you know, morality through the keeping of Sunday and, and other, other things. So when Uriah Smith is, when he's talking about the amendment movement or the amendment manifestation, he's talking about the NRA, not the National Rifle Association, the National Reform Association. And again, we'll talk more about it tomorrow. So again, Uriah Smith says this, the opposition to the religious amendment manifests in many parts of the country, especially by the liberal or infidel element, is thought by many to be an in separable or insuperable barrier in the way of its success. But if we mistake not, this is the very stimulus which will excite its friends to such exertions that it will ultimately be secured. So get the idea again. Some people are saying, well, how's a National Sunday Law ever going to happen when you have all this secularism going on. And Uriah Smith says, it's actually the very thing that's gonna push it into happening. For the opposition assumes such an aggressive attitude that no neutral ground is left. In other words, people are given two choices, this extreme or that extreme, which one do you want? And both will end up in the same place. An irrepressible conflict is precipitated. It must be victory or defeat of the most decisive kind with either party. The government must become wholly, nominally wholly Christian, or in reality, wholly secular. And my question is, are we seeing some of the same forces today? Which should tell us where we're at. And again, my concern, let's not wait until the Monday morning paper tells us there's a Sunday law being enacted before we say it's time to be awake and to learn and to understand what's at stake in liberty of conscience, not just Sunday law. So Uriah Smith continues in his book, Marvel of Nations, and now he's going to describe liberalism's response to the National Reform Association. So liberalism's response to conservatism. <clears throat> and he's quoting from some meeting that leaders of liberals, liberals got together and had a meeting, and he's quoting from that. In opposition to this national reform movement, liberalism sets forth its sweeping antagonistic demands in the following platform. And then they, they have several demands. Notice what they are. We demand that churches other than ecclesiastical and other ecclesiastical priorities shall no longer be exempt from just taxation. We demand that the employment of chaplains in Congress, state legislatures, and so forth uh, not be supported by public money shall be discontinued. Number four, we demand that all religious services now sustained by the government shall be abolished, and especially that the use of the Bible in public schools. We demand that the appointment of all religious festivals and fasts shall wholly cease, you know, so I suppose they would include in their Christmas, Easter, and so forth. We demand that the judicial oath in the courts and all other departments of the government shall be abolished. By the way, have you heard any of these? In other words, you know, no more, you know, do you promise to tell the truth, hold truth, so help you God. Do away with that kind of thing. Number seven, we demand that all laws directly or indirectly enforcing the observance of Sunday as the Sabbath shall be repealed. Now there might be something we could agree on, but the reasoning behind it is primarily driven by saloon owners, and Uriah Smith would address this, not because, you know, there's any concern for religious le legislation. It's just, we don't, we want to be able to sell and make money every day of the week. Number eight, we demand that all laws looking to the enforcement of Christian morality, notice the wording here, shall be abrogated and that all laws shall be conformed to the requirements of natural morality, equal rights, and impartial liberty. And I tell you, this is the driving force with, which is behind what's going on in our country today. 
behind all the letters. And, the, and uh, Uriah Smith does go into a little bit more detail. They wanted to do away with marriage. We demand that not only in the Constitution of the United States, but all the other states, shall be founded and administered on purely secular basis. And then at the end of that, Uriah Smith summarizes, he says, thus, while frequent conventions are held by the National Reform Party, counter conventions are held by the liberalists and the forces are marshalling on either side. So two groups fighting for the supremacy, but both being actuated by the same kind of leaven that was around when Christ first came. He continues, kind of talking about liberalism's response to conservatism. He says, but it might be well to inquire what has given liberalism its recent impulse toward the secularization of the state? Is it not national reform movement itself? We heard nothing about the demands of liberalism nor its specifically aggressive work till the amendmentist, amendmentist, meaning the National Reform Association, seek an amendment to the Constitution, began to seek the aid of civil power in behalf of the religious customs and dogmas. Moral decline <clears throat> led to national reform. We need to make the country Christian. The response, liberalists, we need to make this country secular. And what do you think the response is going to be? No way. We're pushing this through. Uri Smith goes on, this naturally threw the liberalists into an active defense movement under the menace of the loss of their civil rights. Thus the amendmentists find that they have conjured up a demon which would now fain, they would fain exercise. Neither party can recede from the position it has taken the crisis must now come, and the amendmentists have a hard time with that word, see no way to meet on their part, but to carry through to their desperate end the movement by which it, the crisis, has been precipitated. In other words, it's almost like once this thing gets going, you can't stop it because they're forcing each other farther and farther, and then finally will come back together in agreement only under some catastrophe in this country. Well, now he talks about conservatism's response to liberalism. And he actually quotes here from a journal, or actually this is from the uh, Western Book and Tract Society, who obviously was, you know, had a ministry. They weren't involved in the NRA, but notice what they say. When this association, the NRA, was formed, while we were prepared to bid it Godspeed, we did not then feel that there was any pressing need for the object sought. Okay, here's this other Protestant evangelical group. We don't see any need to change the Constitution. And as our mission was specially directed to the Christianizing, enlightening, and elevating of the masses of the people, we have said little in our columns, columns on the subject being assured that if the people are right, it is easy to set the government right. So they, I think they had a good concept. It was very similar to Adventists. So by the way, Uriah Smith, he's quoting from this other Protestant group. But then something changed. And this is what this uh, uh, book society states. They say the late combined efforts, however, of various classes of our citizens to exclude the Bible from our schools, to repeal our Sabbath laws, and divorce our government entirely of religion, from religion, and thus make it an atheistic government, have changed our mind, and we are now prepared to urge the necessity for an implicit acknowledgement in the national constitution of the authority of God and the supremacy of his law as revealed in the scriptures. So again, Uriah Smith in this 20-page section shows Conservatism pushes liberalism farther. Liberalism pushes conservatism farther or more people to join. The problem is they're addressing the problem in the wrong way. Uriah Smith summarizes, he says, the calling for the abolition of all recognition of God and, and religion in the state 
instruments and operations and making the government wholly secular is arousing the fears of all classes of professed Christians and inciting them to repel what they consider the danger. And it's a legitimate danger. Again, the problem is how they're addressing it. Nothing can tend more strongly to precipitate the conflict on the amendment question. So again, I hope this is clear. One extreme is pushing the other extreme farther and farther from one another. And either way, Satan is behind it. Another place, same section, Eurasmus says, the danger is that many will be drawn into the movement without perceiving its true import and the evils to which it will lead. And they will favor an amendment to the Constitution thinking it will be made better, not understanding that the final result will be, not, will be to transform the Constitution from the grand shield of our liberties into an instrument of unrighteousness and oppression. And this is why I think we, I realize I need to understand these things better. How can I go to somebody else, my neighbor, and tell them, you know, be careful about voting, you know, or pushing for this, unless I understand the, the forces and the principles behind all of this, <clears throat> which we can learn from our own history and how our pioneers addressed these things. Well, one, uh, Uriah Smith quotes from one uh, minister from Kansas who was part of the National Reform Association who was even willing to suggest that this liberal movement, he thinks, can be met only by an amendment movement of the National Reform Party, and he leaves it to be inferred that if the success of this movement costs even as great a sacrifice as the suppression of our late political rebellion cost, the sacrifice should be made rather than that the religious amendment movement should fail. In other words, if it means another civil war where thousands and thousands die in order to push this constitutional amendment through, it'll be worth it. Have you even heard the term civil war being talked about, you know, in our political climate today? And again, I think our danger as is, is Adventists is because we, you know, there's aspects that appeal to our, you know, appeal to us, our concerns with this party or that, you know, the, the, the concerns that they have, that we begin to turn a blind eye to some of these other things. You know, Jesus warned that in the end times, because iniquity abounded, the love of many would grow cold. And in politics, I tell you, there's almost no love at all. And it's easy for us to be pulled into that. Now, I'm not saying that there's not legitimate concerns and that we shouldn't be concerned with the degradation of our country that's happening right now. But the way to, the way to deal with it is not through politics. And this is exactly what Uriah Smith goes to next in this section. He ends this section with these concepts. He says, where sh basically it's where we should stand as Adventists. Then he says, with the liberal anti-Sunday movements of the present day, which by the way, Adventists often got thrown into that camp by national reform movement, because they were opposed to Sunday legislation. With the liberal anti-Sunday movements of the present day, considering their associations and the manner and object in, in, in and for which they are carried forward, we have no sympathy. They aim at utter no Sabbathism. They're not concerned about doing away with Sunday laws because of religious liberty. They want to be able to sell you know, more liquor in this Uriah Smith dealt with that in this section. Freedom from all, they want freedom from all moral restraint and all the evils of unbridled intemperance. Ends which we abhor, as Seventh-day Adventists, with all the strength 
of a moral nature quickened by the most intense religious convictions. We therefore here take occasion to put on record a few words defining more fully our position. So you notice that Uriah Smith isn't taking sides. <clears throat> He's defining our position as Seventh-day Adventists, what it should be in addressing both issues. We wish to be understood that we are in the most complete accord and the fullest sympathy with all reforms, which tend to restrain immorality and conduce to the well-being of society. We bid all temperance reformers Godspeed in their noble efforts. We wish all success to the great work of rescuing men from the evils of intemperance. You know, I feel like I, <laughs> I have to say, you know, that, that when the whole intem the temperance movement, you know, uh, stopped uh, in the early 1900s, I feel like we as Adventists, even though we've, you know, would say we're, you know, against alcohol, that we've lost our fervor in, ex in recognizing and expressing the evils of that whole industry. I work in a hospital setting, and probably 50% of the patients I work with are affected somehow by alcohol. And here's, here's my concern, and I, I'm not trying to meddle, but you know, we can sit down and watch football all day Sunday, which is supported and driven by the alcohol industry, and still, you know, say, well, we're thankful we don't drink. I, I really feel like as Adventists, we need to be proclaiming some of these things more. We bid all temperance, I've read that, we wish all success. Then he goes on, we wish all the crippling, blighting, and paralyzing influences to fall upon the vile traffic in intoxicating liquors everywhere. We would restrain it, not only on Sunday, but on every day of the week. So too, we are in favor of divorce reform, prison reform, sa sanitary reforms, labor reforms, against encroachments of monopolies. You hear anybody amongst us voicing concerns about big industry colluding with government? We should be speaking out about those kind of things, being willing to and recognizing that our liberties are quickly being eroded in this country. We, we should, uh, he's in support of reforms to restrain cruelty to children and to animals and to prevent the circulation of vile and blasphemous or obscene manner throughout the mails. We wish the latter reform might be extended also to the publication and circulation in any manner of the dime novel, the curse and abomination. Let the law which is designed to be a safeguard to society take hold of all these things. We care not how rigidly. So again, summarize Uriah Smith's section. He was showing that Satan has used these two extremes and each one keeps pushing the other farther and farther until a culmination would come. And that culmination pretty much did come in the 1880s. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit tomorrow afternoon. Seventh principle, <clears throat> we'll end with this. And that is, I've come to a new understanding in regard to the lamb-like beast that speaks like a dragon. There's been kind of the concept that, in my mind, that, you know, the United States would be this lamb-like beast up until national Sunday laws were enforced and then it would speak like a dragon. Kind of a dispensational view. Whereas I read the pioneers and theirs is more that the United States can, can operate as a, you know, with those lamb-like horns and even in the past on other issues than Sunday has spoken like a dragon. So I just want to show you a couple of excerpts on this. Here's in the appendix of Ellen White's book, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4. This is the first edition of her, after her great controversy vision, where she printed, you know, the book, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4. Uh, in the appendix there, it says, the two-horned beast appears in two phases, with the gentleness of the lamb and the fierceness of the dragon. This has to some extent already been shown. 
in the inconsistencies of sending forth to the world the doctrine of the equality of men in respect to natural rights, the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and yet upholding by law all the evils of American slavery. So here's Ellen White speaking of the United States, speaking like a dragon in regard to slavery. And there's other examples. Here's uh, J.B. Frisbee, 1860. This is not a Sunday law issue. He's talking about the fugitive slave law, slave law, which was passed, which basically made every person in the United States responsible for catching and returning slaves. We have been accused of not quoting this law correctly, says J.B. Frisbee, and so they printed the whole law in the review to make a point. We have therefore taken pains to procure the law and copy out the part we make use of to show the dragon voice from the dragon mouth of the two-horned beast. So here's the United States speaking like a dragon in the 1860s, showing how it makes all of us slave catchers under the penalty of $1,000 fine or six months imprisonment. J.F. John uh, Loughborough, same thing, 1854, he says, this lamb-like appearing government we shall show speaks like a dragon in more points than one. This is the one that really grabbed me. They saw it as, it's not just one point, and it's not just in the future. It could be actually happening now. Our country could be speaking as a dragon right now in some aspects. Instead of carrying out this lamb-like profession, he speaks like a dragon. Yes, that very national executive body who have before them this declaration of independence and profess to be carrying out its principles can pass laws by which 3,500,000 slaves can be held in bondage. While it claims one thing, it's doing another. Again, the whole point being that speaking like a dragon takes in more than just the Sunday law. Well, tomorrow we will continue with the workshop with Ricky presenting more on the, founda the, 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 the raising up the United States and the principles upon which it was founded. Um, and then tomorrow afternoon as well, in my presentation, I'll be talking about prepare, preparation for the latter rain, loud cry and latter rain, conditions in the church, 1844 to 1888, where I want to continue kind of then going to what was happening in the church itself as God was preparing for Minneapolis for the very outpouring of the Holy Spirit to address the, what was taking place in the country, which would basically culminate in Sunday laws coming before Congress. And then again, Sabbath afternoon, I want to show how A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, part of their message, 1880 message, uh, that God intended them to include with the three angels' message was in regard to liberty of conscience. So again, I don't know how to summarize all this. I know it's a lot of information. I would encourage you, by the way, this uh, PowerPoint will be uploaded onto the 1888 Message Study Committee's site. So if you want to get all the references and go read the entire articles, you can do so. But again, I would just say, as an Adventist people, should we be studying, again, our past for the purpose of understanding what could actually be happening right now? And instead of saying, well, I don't see a conservative religious right really active right now, so we have nothing to fear for, we should understand that just like was happening then, there are these antagonistic issues going on right before our eyes that are leading up to the same thing, which should encourage us that if this is going on in the country, then God is letting loose and he's got a message to prepare us to stand during that time. Amen. So would you stand for me, with me as we close with prayer? Father, I just thank you tonight that you have kept this history for us. And even though there has been a long delay, Lord, we long that your coming would be soon. May we understand, Lord, as we should, how you led in the past, how you, the pioneers looked and saw these issues taking place then. And Lord, may we recognize Satan using those same issues today. 
And even more so, Lord, may we see how you are seeking to bring a message of Christ and his righteousness that will be shared around the world as in contrast to, to the way Satan operates in his, uh, his uh, foundational government of force and coercion. Lord, I pray you'll go with each person here. May you bless us as we go to eat and as we come back this evening to share more. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.